In 2012, the worst solar storm in almost 200 years tore through Earth's orbit and missed us by only nine days. Meaning, if it had erupted just a week earlier, or the storm site was pointed slightly differently, it would have ripped across the Sun-Earth divide and pummeled our planet. The resulting firestorm could have knocked out power for millions of people, disabled or permanently damaged our satellites, cut off water distribution, sewage disposal, phone service, fuel resupply, and caused a ripple effect on global infrastructure that would have taken us anywhere from 4 to 10 years to recover from. The economic damage that this would have caused would have been monumental, with some researchers saying the destruction could have been well within the $3 trillion range, making it more expensive than the top 10 worst natural disasters of all time combined. We narrowly missed the worst technological disaster in human history by just one week. And the irony of that being in 2012 is not lost on me. As our sun is currently in the most active and chaotic phase of its 11 year cycle, and will be for the next few months, it did have me wondering, what if the next one doesn't miss? What could prove to be the largest solar storm in over two decades. Very powerful solar explosion. People saw the northern lights as far south as Mississippi. Storms like this will happen again. That latest and final round of the storm has arrived. It's a G4 storm. It's a big eruption that's happened. We've got a strong geomagnetic storm on the way. Solar cycle 25, usually when we're in these peak cycles, we see more energy from the sun. Here we are at the peak of solar cycle 25. Are we in any danger. Although beautiful, they can create problems with satellites, communications, and even the power grid. The burst came from a large and active sunspot. That means an active region on the sun's surface. With critical infrastructure being the most vulnerable. If you have a GPS tractor, it might be uh, driving uh, its own direction. That has happened before when we had the Northern Lights. One of the greatest Northern Lights displays that we've seen in the last 20 years. Welcome to Solar Maximum. I feel like I'm welcoming you to the Hunger Games or something. There is this huge misconception that our sun is on fire, a false idea that might be as old as civilization itself. Ancient humans saw fire as the most powerful force they understood, and the sun looked like a giant glowing version of it. The fire in the sky that gives life to our world can be found in almost every early culture's myths. The Egyptians, ancient Greeks, Hinduism, the Babylonians, all describe the sun as a burning, fiery object. But today, we know that isn't true. To create fire, you need oxygen and fuel to burn. But there is no oxygen in space, and the sun isn't burning its fuel, it's crushing it. 4.6 billion years ago, there was a giant cloud of dust and gas drifting through the Milky Way. And somewhere, not too far away, by universe standards, a nearby star reached the end of its life cycle, collapsed under its own weight, and detonated in one final supernova explosion. This sent shockwaves throughout the galaxy, disrupting our cloud and causing it to spin. As it spun, the material started to make its way towards the center, like a figure skater bringing in their arms, causing it to spin even faster. The cloud collapsed, spinning faster, becoming denser, heavier, and hotter, until its own gravity became so strong that it was fusing itself together on the atomic level and then it ignited. Temperatures at the core are over 15 million degrees Celsius, with an atmospheric pressure over 256 billion times that of Earth. In these extreme conditions, atoms can't even stay intact, and their electrons are stripped away, creating a violent current of electrons and charged particles that we call plasma. This plasma churns, bubbles, and flows around the sun like a boiling ocean, and since it's electrically charged, it creates powerful magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields twist the plasma right back, locked together in a dynamic feedback loop called the solar dynamo, a self-sustaining mechanism where the electrically conducting fluid creates a magnetic field, and the magnetic field then feeds back into the fluid motion to keep the whole thing going. This entire system keeps our sun's magnetic field alive, storing enormous amounts of energy, and is constantly spewing gas and particles into space, creating a constant flow of what we call solar wind or space weather. And just like the weather here on Earth, you can have some nice, calm, easy days, and some not so nice, rough, scary days. Because over time, the magnetic field created by all of this churning plasma becomes so tangled 
and stressed that it eventually becomes unstable, snaps, and then reorganizes itself in the opposite direction, causing a complete reversal of the sun's magnetic north and south poles. As this new magnetic field strengthens, the twisting and churning starts all over again, and the cycle begins anew, approximately once about every 11 years. And we have recorded 25 sun cycles so far, dating all the way back to 1755 with solar cycle 1, and right now we are in solar cycle 25. Scientists can tell you all about the mechanisms of what creates this process and why it happens the way that it does, but we still don't have an answer for why it happens every 11 years specifically. What we do know is that when the poles are reversing, it is the most active, chaotic, and complex time for our sun, a phase that we call solar maximum. In this time of heightened chaos for our sun, we are going to see a major increase in three things. Sunspots, dark regions on the sun where the magnetic field has pierced through the surface, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of kilometers across, areas large enough to swallow our planet many times over. The solar flares, tidal waves of high energy radiation blasting out from our sun's atmosphere, flashes of intense x-rays and ultraviolet light traveling through our solar system at the speed of light reaching Earth in just eight minutes. These can cause radio blackouts, disrupt GPS signals, and produce extremely dangerous levels of radiation for astronauts. We are going to touch on that in a moment. And coronal mass ejections. Actual solar material being blasted into space, like the sun hurling billions of tons of charged particles outwards at 9 million kilometers per hour. CMEs travel much slower than flares, taking anywhere from 15 hours to 3 days to reach our planet. But when they arrive, billions of these particles smash into our planet's magnetic field, causing what we call a geomagnetic storm. These storms can cause extremely strong aurora us, power grid disruptions, damage to satellites, and even blow up transformers on the ground if they're strong enough. During solar minimum, the period of time where the sun is at its calmest, we might get one CME every few days, but during solar maximum, the sun can produce up to 10 or more a day. When these billion ton clouds of magnetized plasma slam into Earth's magnetic field just right, they can cause what is known as a geomagnetic storm. When the CME's magnetic field Field is southward pointing and the Earth's magnetic field is northward pointing, they can lock together like two magnets snapping together. This is a process called magnetic reconnection. When a flood of solar energy enters Earth's magnetic field, it compresses the magnetosphere and sends charged particles spiraling towards the poles, more commonly referred to as the northern or southern lights or the auroras. And when you are watching them, you are watching our planet's literal force field defend us from billions of tons of energetic annihilation. Some real superhero if you ask me. And if you want to know what our planet would look like if we didn't have this magnetic field defending us, just take a look at Mars, a barren, dry, lifeless world. Not all geomagnetic storms are the same. G1s, or a minor storm, are not that rare at all, coming in at about 1700 times a solar cycle. Auroras are commonly visible at high altitudes, there can be minor impact on satellite operations, and weak power grid fluctuations can occur. Most recently, in February of 2022, a G1 storm actually knocked 38 Starlink satellites out of orbit. G2s are a moderate its storm, happening about 600 times every cycle. Auroras can be seen as far down as 55 degrees latitude. Birds and other migratory animals that rely on the Earth's magnetic field can get lost. High altitude power systems can experience voltage alarms, and some satellites may need to be reoriented. G3s are classified as a strong storm, happening about 200 times a cycle. Auroras can be visible as far down as 50 degrees. Satellite and radio navigation can be disrupted, spacecrafts will have to be reoriented, and entire power systems on the ground may need correction. Severe storms are classified as G4 and only happen about 100 times every cycle. Auroras can be seen as far down as 45 degrees, there may be significant satellite problems, navigation and radio systems degrade for hours, and power systems may trip proactively. The most extreme type of storm is classified as a G5. 
Auroras can be visible down at 35 degrees. GPS signals can be degraded for days. High frequency radio can go completely dark. There can be major satellite issues. And on the ground transformers can either be damaged or destroyed, leading to an entire grid collapse. And a few hundred years ago, these storms wouldn't have affected anyone at all because the threat is entirely technological and not biological. There is no scenario where any of these storms can sterilize our planet or destroy us or anything like that, but technology dictates our entire existence. It is our financial systems, our communication, transportation, food production, water distribution, and our navigation. So while there might not be a physical threat to our health, could one really send us back to the Dark Ages? The most intense geomagnetic storm on record took place on the night of September 1st, 1859, just a few months before the solar maximum of Sun Cycle 10. Amateur astronomer Richard Carrington was in Red Hill, United Kingdom, watching the sun with fascination, counting and recording the number of sunspots he could see as they continued to grow. While he was sketching these sunspots, he was blinded by a sudden flash of light, a dazzling white light erupting from a small region of the sun and lasting for five minutes. They were unaware of it at the time, but this flare was a massive CME that was headed straight towards the Earth. And nearly 18 hours later, it unleashed its force on our planet, with auroras being reported in places like Colombia, Panama, southern Japan, and New Zealand, and were so bright in locations closer to the poles that people started getting out of bed, mistaking it for daytime. Now, this was in 18 59 and technology was very sparse, but it wreaked havoc on the technology we had. Telegraph operators were being shocked and sparks were showering from the machines, starting a number of electrical fires. The damage was significant for the time, but if we were to face a Carrington level event today, the damage could be monumental. And we got our first taste of what an extreme geomagnetic storm could really do to our world in March of 1989, just a few months before the solar maximum of sun cycle 22. You see, the world today, and even back then, is covered in millions of kilometers of electrical wire. A CME crashing into our planet is a cloud of billions of charged particles that can induce electrical currents throughout these wires, either causing them to shut down or overload, completely destroying the electrical transformers that power the entire grid. And this isn't just a hypothetical situation. This has happened before, when the strong longest geomagnetic storm in modern recorded history smashed into our planet. And just 90 seconds after reaching the Earth, the entire power grid for the Canadian province of Quebec completely failed. This is an area of land over twice the size of Texas, home to 6 million people, plunged into complete darkness for nearly 10 hours. The first real wake-up call for us that these storms could have real consequences. It's not a question of if another storm similar in size or larger than the Carrington event will reach Earth. It is a question of when. And every single decade, the odds of a Carrington level event hitting our planet is about 12%. The odds of one hitting our planet in the next 50 years is about 50%. The good news is that events like the super solar storm of 1989 caught the attention of infrastructure planners and power companies have begun putting safety measures like tripwires into the electricity grid to stop cascading failure. If power increases too quickly, these tripwires are programmed to switch off so that the damage is limited and transformers don't burn out as they did in 1989. And while we can't prevent solar storms, we can almost completely prevent their side effects. Things like the Parker Solar Probe, the fastest man-made object in history, which I talked about in my last video, are out there watching and studying these coronal mass ejections. Scientists on Earth observing the sun have a few hours to days to see a CME coming, and the engineers working the system that powers our entire world are well aware of the risks posed by solar storms. And the only thing that we really need to do to prevent a total disaster is just unplug things if a storm is headed our way. We can protect the world's electrical grid even from the nastiest of storms. So what happens? if the next one doesn't miss, you can sit back and enjoy the spectacle of Earth's defenses.